Now we need to go to some other reactions that we haven't really talked about yet. Now let's start with the hydroboration oxidation. So let's see what the hydroboration oxidation would do in this case. Still working on number 33 that mentioned oxymercuration and demercuration and hydroboration and oxidation. Hydroboration and oxidation would be the next logical one to look at. So let's think about how that would work here. I don't think that we've talked about that together. No, we kind of did a few problems. We just need to know the mechanism because we know like the BH2 attaches and then the H attaches. We just don't know like the arrows. Well, first of all, what are the reagents for hydroboration and then oxidation? This is a two-step process, and you just have to memorize the reagents. BH3, and your instructor likes you to know the solvents. The standard solvent here is THF. Sounds like some of you got these memorized, but that's good. Another name for BH3 is boron. I guess a lot of people just call it BH3. Now, what's going to happen first here? Boron attaches to the least substituted, and H attaches to the most substituted. Sounds good. Now, it shouldn't be too surprising that this double bond could act like a nucleophile and attack the boron. Why would the boron be an electrophile here? Well, the easiest reason to see why it might be an electrophile is that this boron has an incomplete octet. Boron is one of the elements that, when it's neutral, has an incomplete octet, but that means that it's electron deficient and it doesn't mind gaining electrons here. However, as you guys were mentioning, at the same exact time that this happens, one of the hydrogens attacks the other alkene carbon. This should kind of remind you of what happens when we have a diatomic halogen attacking. When we have a diatomic halogen attacking, we have two attacks happening at the same time. Well, here again, we have the two attacks happening at the same time. The BH2 ends up on the end, on the primary one, right? So with Br2, you would have two attacks happening here, where one carbon attacks the bromine, and the bromine attacks the other carbon. And somebody was saying, well, where does the BH2 end up? On the primary. That's right, which was, means that I didn't set this up too well. So let's try that again. We know it ends up on the primary just because we know that. Yeah, why does it make sense here for the boron to end up on this left hand carbon and not the right hand carbon? Because it's, I don't know why, but I just know in class he told us that boron always is anti Markovian. And then OH is going to go to attach where the BH2 is, and we want it to be anti Markovian. That sounds good. Okay, looks like you guys know the basic steps here. Let's step back and get the logic here a little bit more. You guys were right that the boron will end up on the left-hand carbon. I think some of you already mentioned what the reason is. Why does it make sense for the boron to attach to the left-hand carbon and not the right-hand carbon? Why does it make sense based on the, the considerations that we've learned about in the class? Oh, because when you make the carbocation, you want it to be on the more stabilized one? So there were two suggestions there. One suggestion was forming the more stabilized carbocation, and the other one was steric hindrance. And those are the two big issues in the whole course. Uh, maybe we talked about this last time. The two big considerations in the course here are electronics and steric hindrance. Those are the two big factors that determine how reactions take place, electronics and steric hindrance. But when does electronics matter? It matters when you're forming a charge. Now, in this case, we're actually not forming a carbocation. We're not forming a carbocation because this hydrogen is adding at the same time that the boron is adding. Since the boron and hydrogen add at the same time, there will never be a carbocation. So the consideration here should be the sterics, the steric hindrance. As somebody said, 
the boron is more bulky than the hydrogen, so it should end up on the less sterically hindered carbon. So it's actually not too hard to understand the reason. Since the boron is bigger, it should end up on the carbon with less steric hindrance, and that explains where we're going to be on the left. That's really a reason that we should, that we should know and be able to explain. That would be a fair question to ask during the test. We're not forming any stereo centers, so we don't need wedges or dashes here. That's right. Here's the boron on the less substituted carbon, where it arrived because there's less steric hindrance. Notice there's no carbocations in this mechanism, because the B and the H both added at the same time. Now, what was the name of this first step? This first step is called hydroboration. This first step is called hydroboration, and that's a very logical name, because we're adding hydro, the hydrogen, and boron. So hydroboration is a logical name for this first step. Now, if we wanted to, we could stop right here. However, not many people are interested in forming boron-containing compounds. What we'd like to know is how to form alcohols. Well, the way to make this into an alcohol is to add this next step, hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide. By the way, we should recognize this as a peroxide. We talked about this. When you have two oxygens bound to each other, that's a peroxide. Two oxygens bound to each other is a peroxide. And clearly, you can see where the name hydrogen peroxide came from for this compound. We have already talked about other peroxides for the HBr reaction, how peroxides can be radical initiators, although that's not the role of the peroxide here. All right, and uh, I probably not the best use of our time to go through every detail of this mechanism. Here. Uh, although, actually, you might be testing on it, but the most important thing is to be able to see how to predict the product here. The upshot here, well, let, let's see who's added so far. So far, we've added a hydrogen and the BH2. And basically, what's going to happen now is that you're simply going to replace the BH2 with an OH group. We're simply going to replace the BH2 with an OH group. The mechanism for that is actually kind of complicated. It's not a one-step mechanism. But more important than knowing the mechanism is just knowing the ultimate product. So here's the product. Do we have to know it? Like, should we learn it? On our you own should time? learn it. Tell you what, let's see. So let's go over what's most important here, which is predicting the product. And then in the handout, I've got the full mechanism. So rather than going through the whole mechanism step by step, I'll point out the key features on the handout. It's also covered in the second language book. And it's covered in the textbook. But let's just start with what's most important, which is the product here. So we simply replace the BH2 with this OH group over here. Nothing happens to this hydrogen. By the way, this happens, let's see, with retention of, oh, there's a couple things that we should talk about here. When these two groups added over here, did the, B, did the boron and the hydrogen, would you expect them to add sin or anti? Sin. Why does it make sense that they should add sin? Because they're like, connected to each other. Yeah, they're connected and they're coming in at the same time. Since they're connected and coming in from the same time, they have to be coming in from the same direction. So if they're connected and coming in at the same time, they have to be coming from the same direction. Remember, there was a kind of similar explanation for why hydrogenation was sin, because the hydrogens were both connected to the same spec of metal, and, they were coming, uh, and so they were coming from the same direction. So this should be sin. In this case, that didn't matter because there was no stereochemistry. Since there was no stereochemistry here, it didn't matter that this was sin. But on many problems, it would matter. So you do need to know this is sin. And you should be able to explain why, because they're both attacking from the same molecule. And it turns out that when we replace the boron with the OH, we do that with retention of configuration. We do that with retention of configuration. So wherever the boron used to be, so if I had put the boron here on a wedge, then I would have put the OH on a wedge as well. In fact, let me just put in some wedges here just to show that. I'm going to put this hydrogen on a wedge and this boron on a wedge. Those are not really necessary here because these are not stereocenters. But if I'm going to put this on a wedge, I should put the boron on a wedge too. And then I would put the OH on a wedge. That's what we mean when we say this reaction happens with retention of configuration. If the boron was on a wedge in one picture, then the OH should be on a wedge in the next picture. We should just memorize that this step happens with retention of configuration. So just like the boron, so ultimately, is it like the OH and the H added sin or anti? Sin. sin. 
Even though they didn't add at the same time, it's a sin addition ultimately of an OH and an H. Ultimately, this is a sin addition of an OH and an H, because the OH just replaces what the BH2 used to be. So that's going to be important on problems as well, that this is ultimately sin. So when you start with an alkene and you end with an OH on the less substituted one, that's when you want to do this. Precisely. That's exactly right. So what would be a good name for this reaction? Well, well we could simply say hydroboration. And then what was the second step? The second step is called oxidation. Remember that oxidation is when you're forming more bonds to oxygen. Well, here we had a bond to boron, but we replaced that with a bond to oxygen. So you can see why the second step is called oxidation. That's really not that helpful a name, though. It, it would have been better, probably, if they'd called this uh, alcoholation, because what's really happening in the second step is that we're replacing the boron with an alcohol group. But anyway, the oxidation here, we just need to know, it gives us an alcohol group. 